How high can a man fly? How high can a ladybird soar? What a surfer has been able to achieve above the lip of the wave has long been what defines progression in modern surfing. Aerial surfing began in the late 1970s by a small handful of surfers. However, it wasn't until the early 80s when Martin Potter started pushing surfing's progression above the lip, inspiring then-teenagers Christian Fletcher and Matt Archibald, and shortly thereafter, Christian's younger brother Nathan. Since then, progression in aerial surfing has only been on a slow incline. This isn't skateboarding, BMX, or motocross. See, perfect ramps in the ocean are fleeting moments that are hard to find and easy to miss. Airs completed in the ocean that have enough impact to make the surf community stop and take notice are rare events that happen a few times a year, at most. Engineers had experimented with man-made waves for decades, but this never resulted in a platform for progressive surfing. It wasn't until 2018 that a wave pool in Waco, Texas called BSR Surf Resort unintentionally created the perfect air section. Using perfect swell technology, the pool offered a constant stream of waves that were tailor-made for aerial surfing and a competitive arena unlike anyone had ever seen. In September 2018, surf media house Stab Magazine launched Stab High, a first-of-its-kind aerial surfing competition. Oh my goodness. Oh my okay. It's like the most perfect ramp I've ever surfed, so to have a comp in it just seems right, you know? Wow. And then it'll be good to see the future of everything. Just sucking air out of your tires. Here we go. Chippa Wilson. Fries it up. Guys, the man. Oh, that was sick. Reverse. After two groundbreaking Stab High events in 2018 and 2019 at BSR, Stab confirmed a three event world tour in 2020, only to have the world shut down just days from the launch of the first event in Melbourne, Australia. Six months later, the two more events canceled an opportunity arose for a stab high at an unlikely but more than familiar destination, the Mentalize. We love the pools, we love the controlled environment, we love the party atmosphere, but we will absolutely be back in the ocean. That's where the pinnacle of performance will live, so that's the plan for it. In the mid-1990s, Indonesia's newly discovered Mentawai Islands were surfing's closest thing to a wave pool and served as the backdrop for the decade's most radical surfing. Once performed over the safety of sand, airs are now being attempted and perfected over Indo's sharp and shallow reef. Despite its inherent danger, the reef provided a predictability that allowed surfers to progress at a rapid rate, much like modern wave pools have done for today's next gen. With severe regulations affecting travel worldwide, in 2020, the Mentawais were the least crowded they'd been since their discovery in the late 1980s. Uh-oh, another one. Alan. Woo! Now was the opportunity to see if the same level of progression we've witnessed at past stab highs can happen in the ocean. And will the surfers who succeeded in the pool be able to perform in the ocean? Following strict COVID guidelines and with Australia's borders closed, preventing past at my champions Noah Dean and Chippa Wilson from joining, we assembled our cast of 11 male surfers and four ladybirds for Stab High's first ocean-borne blow-up. It's firing over now. The win win. Wait, this next one, this next one. I think this is safe to say this is the best man I've ever sure. This is Van Stab High, non chlorine edition, presented by Monster Energy. This is Stab High, non chlorine, in the Mentawi Islands. 11 surfers for 10 days, 
the best air right left combination will win this event. So how does this competition work? Over this 10 day boat trip, Nathan Fletcher, Mikey February, and Stab will score every completed aerial on a scale of one to 10 based on their height, style, and progression, creating a total score out of 30. How they get there and how they finish is taken into consideration, but what happens in the air matters most. Each surfer's high scoring right and left air will count towards their total score. Whoever finishes the trip with the highest two wave total will be stab high winner and $12,000 richer. The Ladybirds, presented by Vans, will follow the same format in hopes of winning $3,000. In addition, each surfer will also have an opportunity to win Stab High's Monster Air Award, presented by Monster Energy, where only height and difficulty on a single air are taken into consideration. Past Monster Air winners have been Aton Osborne and Cam Richards. This is like the best contest I've ever done. It was different than any other surf contest or any other event and um, I think there should be way more of these. But who are these judges anyway? Stab invited Nathan Fletcher, Progressive Surfing's North Star since the early 90s, and Mikey February, who brings a modern day approach to alternative equipment to be our two judges. And actually the person I'm most stoked to see is Mikey February. To watch Mikey's is it's awesome. It's like watching new, old, everything wrapped up into just an effortless surfer. Yeah, what I want to see most from all these surfers is I like it when things look really nice and, and clean. So just something that's like, you know, airs that have, where they have like a really nice style and kind of finish it really nicely. Having fun and going big and camaraderie between each other and cheering each other on to, so they go bigger. It's definitely new, it's revolutionary, and hopefully it changes people's mind to what can be done in a competition format where you can be paid, you can enjoy yourself, you can cheer on your friends, and uh, you can rip. Our story begins in Los Angeles, where eight surfers would travel 9,000 miles to meet the rest of the crew and launch from Padang Harbor in West Sumatra. From there, it's an eight-hour overnight boat ride to HT's, formerly known as Lance's Right, after Australian surfer Lance Knight, who's rumored to have discovered the wave in 1991. As we checked in over a dozen board bags, 330 pounds of additional luggage, and accrued $1,500 in excess baggage fees, it suddenly became apparent we were one surfer shy of a full roster. After 30 phone calls and 100 text messages to brothers, moms, groms, and friends, Eric Eiselman was spotted at a familiar location. Check your phone. Oh, what'd you do, dude? What about it? Oh, I missed my flight? How'd I miss my flight? What do you mean I missed my flight? Did I read my itinerary wrong? I thought it was tonight. I swear it said uh, 12 p.m., but I guess it was a.m. Unreal. I had missed my flight. <laughs> I read my itinerary wrong. It was a.m., not p.m. So 12 p.m. is noon, Eric. Oh, I, I understand that. <laughs> oh, I was like, oh, I got a 1 a.m. flight. I'm sweet. <laughs> That's what I said. Are you kidding me? Bro, I read my itinerary like eight times, just browsing. I'm like, oh, 12.45. I'm thinking like I had a 1 a.m. flight. I'm like, oh, for sure they're going to do a red eye to Tokyo. So Brandon Gibbons is on the trip, and I'm getting a speedboat with him on Monday. Luckily, luckily. With Eric able to get on a flight the next day, we immediately started trying to find someone to chaperone him and round out our roster. We were thrilled to find that South Africa's rubber-legged aerialist, Brendan Gibbons, was in Costa Mesa, healthy and ready to go. The two would miss a day and a half of average surf and arrive by a speedboat just in time for the new swell. While the men were airborne, and with new tickets booked for Eric and Brendan, our ladybirds were getting settled up north in Kandui, otherwise known as the playground. But who are the ladybirds, and how did they get here? Competitive and ambitious, but more than friendly with one another, Caitlin, Bella, and Sierra have all remained close since last year's Stab High, 
The ladybirds thing was absolutely mind blowing for us. I can't believe they made the airs they did. And there was this energy and we were just going, what is going on? At 10 or 12 or 13, you don't get the main stage. It was just a really extraordinary moment. That was epic. Good job, Sky. Good job, everyone. That was super fun. So we're going to be watching the best, most progressive 12, 13, 14 year old girls in the world surf and probably battle the professional males for their air awareness. While the performances at BSR sparked a radical shift in young women's progressive surfing, this year we invited the ladybirds to the mentalize to take their pool hone tricks out of the chlorine and into the real waves. The new addition to the squad was 13-year-old Aaron Brooks. In 2020, you can't talk about progressive female surfers without mentioning Aaron. Her casual air reverses at BSR have stopped social feeds in their tracks. I got a thin slice right in my head and I had to get 11 staples. All of the girls, everybody was here, they've just been super supportive and nice. But I'm super excited, I'm probably going to get back in the water, get to do the contest with all the ladybirds. Nice. You get some boards out? Yes, please. Oh, this, this, this is the air, the board that's gonna make me do airs. <laughs> I have ridden one before, but only in a wave pool. By now, everyone knows that the neck beard was designed by Dane Reynolds in Channel Islands in 2011. After Dane asked to chop the tail off a traditional 90s style shortboard, creating a wide-tailed flatboard designed for the small waves. The unusual shape resulted in a surfboard that was faster down the line and was more stable when landing airs. What you might not know is that for these very same reasons, the neckbeard has been the most used surfboard at Stab High. All of us from a young age, we start with like a normal thruster, like performance board. Whereas if someone else takes a bit more time from a young age to work on a more alternative surfboards, I feel like they could ride those boards just as well. I just don't think people give themselves the time. I feel like every person on tour needs one, one event where they have to ride something alternative. It's a 
regular foot piece. Have you checked this one out yet? Yeah, we checked it out. My name is Sebastian Williams Hernandez. I'm 20 years old and I'm from Puerto Escondido, Oaxaca, Mexico. My first mentalized boat trip right now. And the surfer that's gonna surprise everybody is Seb Williams. Sebastian Williams. Sebastian, I definitely never heard of him. And he's got crazy pop. It's fun to watch. He's just so naturally talented and he would do backflips like it's just a little freaking off the lip. You can just tell his stick ratio is so high and he's going for stuff that's so big. Just does things that it looks so flowish and steamy. I feel like he's just something that's just being tapped into and once he flourishes, it's gonna be like crazy in the air and at surfing. Uh, 50 bucks. I'm about to buy it. <laughs> yes. Okay, so the swell's gonna get, normally here it drops off quite dramatically at low tide unless there's good swell. Why don't we do this? Let's just wait till 11 o'clock. Faced with mediocre conditions, the boys knew they'd have to do something huge if they wanted to make an early dent. It's going to be coming on and it'll start to get better and better. I'm surprised by Al. I'd never seen him surf before and he's just like, just shitting on everyone out there. It's pretty impressive. You can't read your itinerary right? And I'm like, I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> She's like, no, I understand. You're not on the plane. <laughs> contest I don't think should count but as soon as you go above the lip and show control rotating 
I guess it's called an air reverse full rotation, whatever. But I feel like then there's control and technique. Pause right here. Nathan, what's an air reverse? I guess the air reverse came after somewhat the backside chop up. And so at that point, I don't know what year it was, probably 87. Christian called it a loader, which was low orbital transitional rotation. The air reverse, I feel, started right around then, but I just know that it evolved into a normal modern trick that is commonly used. And so it's super radical, but people have it so wired that they could do it safely now and controlled. And if it's big and you go around straight to straight, that's rarely seen and rarely made. But for me, I feel like the second one that I mentioned is the true definition of the progression of the air reverse. So I think that's what an air reverse is at this moment. And I feel like it's one of the harder, better tricks if it's done high and completed, especially with no hands because you're using the rotation and the wind. So you're ollie and so it's all board control where when you're grabbing and rotating, it's harder to land because you're closer to your board. And then the next one is the double grab, which in my opinion, you have to be going more than a full rotation to be doing that or be going upside down of some sort and rotating. Thanks, Nathan. Why are the boys huddled up inside this poorly lit dinette? This is the daily roundtable conversation where they discuss each day's best maneuvers and establish the leaders. So today I feel like it was maybe between Al and Rio on those two waves. Yeah, you know? I feel the same, yeah. Alan's landing was kind of nice and smooth. Rio's was more controlled, maybe better style and stuff. I think Alan's might have been a little bigger and a little bit more out of control with a better landing. I th I'm gonna say this, in my personal opinion, I think Crosby's still in the lead because I don't see anybody that did anything more than what Crosby did yesterday. Yeah, I reckon Crosby's starfish was probably the most like, I don't know what I did, all around it. Pretty yeah. critical. Yeah. yeah, a lot of bottles. Crosby! Crosby! Yeah. Yeah. Crosby! Yeah. Crosby. Yeah. Crosby. Yeah. As our first two days come to an end, let's take a look at the current Stab High scorecard. With a major swell forecasted for the next day, the surfers debate whether they should set anchor at HTs or make an overnight voyage to the world-renowned left-hander Macaronis. Depending on how big the swell gets, but I honestly, I back the call to go to Macaronis too. I want to stay here. I'm going to tell you right now, this wave on is bigger is not that good for airs, but we will be probably getting barreled. If it goes offshore, you're definitely not doing errors. And the winds on the crip wind in the left, and that's what he said. That's, that's what he said. I don't want to miss that. Yeah, in the end call, though, if you miss three hours of your day, and we don't do any errors here, and then we get there at 2.30, and you only get the afternoon, whereas if we go tonight and motor, and we're there, we surf all day or whatever, we go in and out, the wind goes on, and we're ready for it. And another fact is you're wasting three hours of the day, That's no matter true, what yeah. the case is. And so we just don't want to do that, period. I just think it's going to be really fun tomorrow at HT's. I think it's going to be like shoulder to slightly overhead and launchable. What gives you that feeling it's going to be shoulder to head high tomorrow? I just don't see the swell pulling in at eight feet tomorrow from the looks of how it was today. Tune in next episode, where an unlikely catalyst ignites 13 surfers, setting a new bar for height and progression at one of surfing's most revered lefts. I actually think that was the best surfing day of my life. The rays of light, we're shooting down. Woo! That's fucking insane, are you kidding me?